Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Lorber. I'm the director of Rain Taxi, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our 20th Twin Cities Book Festival. We are really glad to be doing this. We miss doing it in person. We uh, certainly um, uh, miss seeing all your smiling faces, but we're uh, pretty jazzed that uh, we're gathering so many people together online today. Uh, some great conversations have broken out uh, both among the authors and among the audiences, and uh, it's been a real joy to see. Uh, please keep it up. Uh, I'm sure you know there are so many other aspects of our festival to explore. Uh, we have 19 events like this one featuring authors in discussion. Uh, we've got some pre-recorded presentations in our Minnesota Writers Mashup and our new chapbook launch that are really worth checking out at your leisure. And of course, uh, an incredible assortment of publishers, organizations, and authors in our exhibit hall, um, all of whom are offering uh, great deals and telling you about their new products. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce this event. We always have a at least one poetry showcase. This year we have two, so come back uh, tomorrow uh, if you're interested. Uh, today we have three incredible authors, uh, and I'll tell you about them right now. Uh, Sumita Chakraborty is celebrating her debut collection, Arrow, which has just come out from Alice James book, Books. Uh, I know Samita from way back because she has written some incredible reviews and essays for Rain Taxi, uh, of which I've been so um, happy and appreciative of. Uh, Joy Priest is joining us from Houston, and uh, her incredible new book, Horsepower, was chosen by Natasha Trethaway for the Donald Hall Prize at the Pitt Poetry Series. Uh, you're going to want to get your hands on this. It's incredible. And... We are celebrating the release of Minneapolis author Hyde Erdrich's newest book, which is the National Poetry Series winner, Little Big Bully, just out from Penguin Books. Uh, like all of Hyde's previous work, it's an immersive experience. Um, and, uh, and again, I just encourage you to read all of these books. Uh, it's, I will say on a personal note that it's uh, been wonderful. I think I've read all of Hyde's books at, pretty much as they've come out, and it's been an incredible way to take a journey uh, with a poet. I'm looking forward to doing that with Joy and with Sumita as they continue to release work uh, over the years. And I'm just so excited to have this group together. Uh, moderating our session is another wonderful Minneapolis poet, Chris Biak, uh, who is uh, here in the Twin Cities with us, and in fact is one of the people behind the scenes who has helped put our annual festival together this year. Thank you all so much. And uh, I do want to just remind the audience that you can ask questions, you can buy books, and uh, you can donate if you choose to Rain Taxi at the bottom of your screen. Uh, uh, all of that is another way to stay engaged with us and to um, uh, keep supporting literature in uh, all its forms here in the Twin Cities and around the world. Thanks again, and take it away, Chris. Thank you, Eric. Um, it is so wonderful to be in the same room with all three of you. I feel like I've been spending a lot of time with you because I've been reading your books. Of course, that's just a tiny part of who you are. Um, but uh, what fantastic books these were, and what a variety of tone and voice and um, the one thing they had all had in common was how powerful they were and how amazing. And so I'm, I'm so excited to be here with you today. Um, what we were going to do for the session is um, have each poet read a poem aloud, and then we're going to have a discussion um, centered around um, topics related to women and poetry, because one of the uh, uniting factors of the of their books was their addressing of those kinds of issues. And so what I'm going to do is ask each poet to read aloud a poem that um, I think spoke to this issue. And then if you want to, too, tell us a little bit about what the impetus for writing this poem was. It's up to you how much you want to say ahead of time. I know some people like to do that and some people don't. So up to you, whatever you want to do for that. So. Um, Let's begin with Joy. Um, go ahead and uh, read your poem, please, for us. 
<clears throat> All the men that summer who said, I love you. After I made it out to the country, the panic attacks came on like minutes, indiscernible, ceaseless. The fence leaned perpetually and the AC unit droned on and on in the window of the double wide. The mail planes passed overhead like water from a hose, the most I counted while out for a smoke was 13, landing one behind the other. Out there, the world was steady, untroubled, but my body wouldn't let me believe. Brandy's mother let me sit alone in her jacuzzi for hours, comforted me with rolled cigarettes and coffee, a hymnal heavy hand on the back. Brandy came home with a bottle of Captain every night after her shift at the Golden Corral and sat with me under the tin roof on the makeshift porch while I confessed how that summer after my fiance followed me through Chinatown for an hour yelling it, while I looked for the bus stop, I'd piss myself and rode the 14 hours back to Kentucky, mildew and smoke. And how once there, my father said it, while he rifled through my fiance's abandoned car, looking for evidence. And again, he said it while he was interrogating me in drunken fits after finding the name Muhammad on the insurance cards. And are you fraternizing with a foreign operative? He asked over and over again with a loaded pistol between us on the kitchen table and how I'd fled him as I would an assailant, ending up at Misty's, a woman I waited tables with. And how her husband had looked at me desperately as I was leaving and said it, I love you and how he'd crept into the room where I slept whispering it while Misty was sound asleep in the next, an empty balloon lightly dusted on the nightstand and how there had been no panic in my body then and then and then and then or then. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Sumita, would you like to go next? Sure. <clears throat> so the poem I'm going to read uh, is called O Spirit, and I won't say too much about it since we are all going to be discussing things for some time. What I will say is that the entire book takes place in the aftermath of violence, and particularly autobiographically domestic violence. And this poem comes from kind of a midpoint in the book, um, not kind of, quite literally a midpoint in the book, where the speaker is looking back and really taking stock of the ways in which she has thought about the violence to which she's been subjected, um, as well as the ways in which she's asked to describe it or account for it in the broader world. So that latter question in particular is what it is what this poem is about. Oh, spirit. It takes work for a woman to welcome a fist with her body. Fists are larger than the spaces they make for themselves in a chest or the holes into which we welcome them with longing. Asking whether I wish for one now because I knew them well as a child is like asking if a volcano expels lava because when a small mountain cloistered within sea waters, its first experience of heat was unbidden. The question requires a certain old knowledge of safety to ask. What does it mean that the first time you saw a cock, it was raised in menace from a boil of shared blood, the question says. Tell me the origin story of pain and tell me what happens to pain as it ages and tell me how the ocean bottom dirt you grew from tastes. Volcanoes understand differences in kinds and in chords. The origin story of pain is abjection, foisted. Not a single stream of lava is like one that has come before or will come since. All my lips make treacherous lights float in midair. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, and go ahead, Hyde. We'll have you read your poem. And thank you.
Big Sur. Massive block of a man takes the light, turns up his chin. Sun exists to shine for him. The deep shadow of his form forms a field, a force, repulsion and pull of someone brutal and strong. Cold eclipse, his proximity shivers in heat, something back from childhood. When we learned in the taste of grit and dirt to get up, be safe or brave, learn two sides, the line, hide behind or step up, but never get between the mean mass and his light. He needs his shine, needs the dark too, the one made for design, that blacker than black, that deep shade, trailing shadow of mad dad, bad boy, stalker, wife beater, boss. We all hide where we grew, comfortable in what we knew, where to stand off to his bad side, or we let him stand between us and them, us or them, us or them. Behemoth shadow so terrible, his need so big. We just get smaller without melting. He keeps us cool. Such shade here, such screen against too bright, right, or dazzle of wrong, writer right to wash the wrong, darker than that design, dark his shadow, a cape, no one tugs. We just ski along his toe and the excuse not to choose until he needs to hear like the Jesus some believe craves praise even a lame note behind you sometimes stepping on your strong big strong something wrong even to we we so small please we need please you big sir us please on our knees <laughs> wow that was amazing that all of your poems were just so well read and so well written. It was great to hear them out loud too. Um, I feel like I got even more from them uh, being out loud. Um, can we unmute the presenters, please? Um, we're gonna launch the discussion. Um, so as you've heard, uh, these poems are very powerful and address um, issues of the patriarchy, toxic masculinity, sexual harassment and violence against women and particularly against women of color. And so to begin, I'd like us to consider two quotes from the poet and activist Audre Lorde. He writes, um, I write for those women who do not speak, for those who do not have a voice because we're so terrified, because we are taught to respect fear more than ourselves. We've been taught that silence won't save us. Would, sorry, sorry. We've been taught that silence would save us, but it won't. For women then, poetry is not a luxury. It is a vital necessity of our existence. It forms the quality of light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams towards survival and change, first made into language, then into idea, then into more tangible action. 
poetry is the way we give, the, the way we help give name to the nameless so it can be thought. The farthest horizons of our hopes and fears are cobbled by our poems, far from the rock experiences of our daily lives. So what I'd like to ask you to talk about is how you see poetry and your work in particular giving voice to those who do not have a voice. And if you're comfortable with it, speaking to how you overcame the expectation or urge to be fearful, to keep silent, and how you might advise um, newer poets or others to begin speaking their truth through poetry. Would anyone like to go first and just raise your hand? <laughs> I'm happy to go first if no right. one else has died. Oh, sure. Um, so I think for me, I might zig a little bit to the question, Zag, if you don't mind. I don't. Um, tend to think that anyone is voiceless. I, I'm in reflecting on this. I think about um, Gayatri Spivak's essay about whether or not the subaltern can speak, and that essay isn't about whether or not the subaltern is capable of articulating, but about whether anyone is listening and whether anyone is hearing that articulation. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, as I have the privilege and the great gift of having a platform, no matter how small or how large that is, it is important for me to use that to work on the people hearing part, not necessarily the vocalizing for other people, um, because it, it, it seems to me that the part that I can make an intervention on, if anything, is is having more people here rather than you know ventriloquizing anyone else. And then for me, um, in terms of how I came to overcome fear myself, I, I would say that I wouldn't portray it as particularly linear. You know, there are poems that I'm writing now that scare me, that will scare me when they come out. There are many poems in this book that scare me to be out. Um, and as a survivor of domestic violence, I just, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a brass tack sort of person in some ways. Um, for a very long time, it literally was not safe for me to speak at all. And I have a poem in this book where I talk about how my, my earliest poems were very abstract. And that wasn't at the time because I loved abstraction. It was because it wouldn't have been safe for me to state straightforwardly state where I was or what I had been through due to threats against my life and, and my, sibling, my siblings and my mother's life. Um, so I think that, you know, as a practical person myself, I, I would probably recommend, um, yes, take very good care of the parts of yourself that are afraid. Um, know that they may still be afraid at some point in the future and that's okay. And that's a way in which you've learned to survive. And if you're safe, then work with and dance with the fear that brought you. And if you're not safe, that's priority number one, you know. Great. Yeah, I like framing it with the idea of listening. You know, like like how how do we how do we get people to listen to what we're saying as women, right? And and engage with these ideas. So, or Hyde, do you have anything to add to that or piggyback off that? Yeah, yeah, that was um, that was very similar to sort of how I was thinking about as I went back and close read, because I, you know, I, I teach this essay every semester, but when I really went back and look, looked at the quote, I was thinking like, I don't know if she's necessarily saying giving, like, I don't know if the word give occurs at all, like giving someone something they don't have. Um, more so as she says, I write for, which is I think the notion of, um, I think that notion is colonial kind of, just to say I'm giving, mm -hmm to those who do not have a voice because it's erasure, it's erasing. Mm -hmm. And it's saying, I'm speaking for you. But I think when she says, I write for those, and the rest of that is those who do not have a voice on their own accord, like because they, they, they are scared. So it's like, a, so she's acknowledging the choice to be silent of them. And mm -hmm. saying, I write for them, which I think as Samita's playing out is an act of listening saying, I hear you, I'm waiting for you. And also rather than giving rather than giving those who 
who do not have a voice or voice maybe just 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 uh being an example of like what you can do uh like this this alternative you have because when i think about it also another reframing i would another way i would frame this is um you asked uh how you, how we overcame the expectation or the urge to be silent or to be silent and i think writing actually started as a way for me to maintain silence so as to me to saying in these like um fraught spaces where you can't use your voice like um, physically uh, or there's fear around doing so i think for me writing started because it was a way for me to express articulate talk about mm -hmm. um, what was happening to me or some of the things that i wasn't being heard when i was saying out loud or you know that sort of thing so um yeah i think writing can actually start in silence and it's interesting too that audrey in in writing these essays and sister outsiders she's talking to not just men but also like other women who aren't women of color who aren't listening to women of color mm -hmm. and so talking specifically about um articulating uh this very specific subjectivity that is not being listened to um and so yeah i just i, just, I yeah, thank you for that. I, I think, too, you know, when I was just thinking about the wording of writing for somebody, too, you think she's saying as an audience, you know, mm -hmm. that these are like, I'm writing for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Hyde, what, what, what would you have to add to that? Like, um, Not much. I feel a lot of what both of the other poets said um, the only thing I'd added is that quote has, has been part of my teaching. I want to make sure that as a teacher, I make room for voices. So, um, and then the power of silence, I think is really important because silence can be imposed, you know, can be an oppression but it can also be your saving grace in some relationships because there's only one way to really shut people up who are harassing you. Then you just don't talk, you know, that really helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, I want to remind everybody too, it looks like we have two questions already, but if you do have questions either about the poems or the conversation that we're having, please click on that ask a question or put it in chat and um, we will get to those in a few minutes. Um, I had a second question before we get to that though. Um, how is poetry as Lord says a vital necessity of our existence as women and or as humans? You can expand that if you like. Um, please share an example of a time you read a poem by a female poet that resonated with you and or whose work you think gives name to the nameless so it can be thought. And so I'm in, inviting you to share, you know, who you're a fan of and, you know, um, why you appreciate this poet's work and, and how it fulfills that for you. Thank you. Hi, why don't you go first? <laughs> yeah, I, I think of a line from Joy Harjo a lot and it says, we have too many stories we carry on our backs like houses. Hush, hush, go to sleep. Don't let the monster steal our sleep. And that has helped me understand how we embody stories and also how fear controls us. And a lot of this book, is about overcoming fear. Yes, I would agree. I, um, I, and I, I really enjoyed that about your book, actually, because that's something I've been trying to do for a while, <laughs> just in general. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we how all have. We right. all are. Right. Right. How about you, Sumita? Sure. Um, yeah, like. Um, 
like Joy and like Hyde, I, I teach this essay every semester too, or it informs my teaching in some other way. Um, no, I think every single semester I've taught it. Um, I think the thing that I like, I think Lord writes this around the point where she writes the quote that you picked out, that there are no new ideas, only new ways of making ideas felt. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the part, that's the little kernel from this, that this part of the essay that really stands out to me. Um, because for me, you might disagree or agree with the idea that there are no new ideas. For me, I think there's. it's very likely that if Audre Lorde didn't think she had new ideas, I probably won't come up with a new idea. Um, but it's that idea that no matter who someone is, um, they can put a very familiar feeling or emotion or experience into, into a new way of registering it in your body and in your mind and in your somatic landscape. That's the thing that keeps me coming back, I think, to poetry in particular. Um, it would be hard for me to pick just one woman poet who has influenced me in some way. I tend to think of each uh, poem I write as having its own patron saints, plural, because otherwise if I tried to answer this question exhaustively, it would go on for a really long time. Um, some of the patron saints for this book in particular were Bridget Pegeen Kelly, Lucille Clifton, uh, Ada Limon, and Alice Oswald, so, and Marie Howe, and many, many, many more. <laughs> so I'll pause there. I love that idea of having a patron saint for your book or several. That's that's a wonderful idea. Thank you. It has an entire kin out there of poets who it owes its existence to. Wonderful. And how about you, Joy? Um, yeah, so if I could just start out talking about the question, um, yeah. how is poetry a vital necessity of our existence as women? To, in, in contextualizing it a little bit because there, like she uses this phrase throughout the book, which is like uh, white fathers. And so she's responding to um, this established, uh, you know, attitude in the academy or this established like epistemology of, I think like uh, of poetics, which is like, um, you know, beauty based on technical rigor or craft mastery. And it, and and I really believe that we don't think about the tradition of black feminine, like this era of black feminism as um, as one of the uh, traditions of, of American poetics um, where black feminists started getting together in groups and, and also along in solidarity with um, uh, Latinx women and native women um, and articulating their particular oppressions that she talks about. So I think she's she's talking about poetry as a vital necessity of our existence as a way to articulate those things, not just to, to make something beautiful. Um, and so I, so yeah, so I I think for me those poets have been uh, you know Nikki Finney, um, uh, Natasha Trethaway, um, and. Oh, who was I thinking about earlier? Uh, I, 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 there's no way for me to ever answer a question like think of one poem. <laughs> like, I'll be walking around my house for hours, like trying to find, like remember. You don't ever write these things down when you come across like a poem, like or it's in a Google Drive somewhere. But uh, I just picked up like the closest book to me, and um, it was Francine J. Harris's latest book, *Tears uh, and I thought about like when, it, in terms of women articulating these very specific and nuanced and subtle like sort of experiences we have, I think about like writing about the body and all these other things. But like, this is a really small thing. It's, it, I, it might seem silly um, that I thought of this as, but it's really important to me that these really small nuanced things get articulated. And it's really short poem, but um, the meat. It's election day, it's the finest day in history, the air is crisp and the tone is full of hope. My party is weighing in early, there are victory flags in the sky. And the whole morning I am haunted by the memory of a lover who at the end of everything told me I had no ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
you all day. And it's like, thank you for writing that poem because I felt that way before, you know? And it's, but it is, it's a part of it. It's a story, but it's a part of this larger thing, which is that our as women, our bodies are constantly under scrutiny. We're having to perform femininity in ways that don't allow us to just like sometimes feel free in our own bodies. And like, so that's what I think of when I think of a poem that is a vital necessity of our existence. That, that's amazing. And I, I, it's funny because as you were talking, I was thinking about the Kamala Harris and Pence debate <laughs> and how, yeah, people were criticizing her, the look on her face and things like that, you know, and, and uh, it's a, a prime example of that exact thing. So. Or, or like uh, the judge that um, that's going through confirmation. Um, right. She's like, the way she talked to her yesterday, for me, I picked up on it. It was very loud to me, her, the tone of voice with which she was speaking to her. Uh, but if, if no one articulates that or like pulls it out of the air and puts it in a poem, like it'll just, like a, like a million women will notice it together, but it'll, be, it'll remain in the silence. So. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple of questions from the audience. I want to make sure to get to those. Um, our first one is from um, Wendy Gonzalez Baez. She says, was writing a healing process and how does that healing change over time as you read your work to audiences? I'll start with that and be contrary as usual. Um, Healing is so long, has so many levels and layers. I think I was more interested in recovery. How do we recover a sense of self, um, even if it's a wounded self? And how do we prevent further harm? So when you say recovery, you're saying it kind of in terms of like, there's no real end point where you're miraculously completely healed. It's more of the process. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It also felt what you were saying, this difference between like this individual process and, and this process that will like affect and be beneficial to like more than just the cell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, healing is a gerund for a reason, right? Like it's that's gonna go on for a minute. I don't hide. I completely agree with that. Enjoy you too. Um, I think for me, it is important not to discount the power that writing might have in affecting how we change the narratives that we have in our own minds about what we've experienced, but all the same to hold healing um, and writing as two quite different things. I mean, I know for me, I frequently say that I had to become the person who could write this book in order to write it. And that journey didn't take, it. in some cases took place on the page with craft. Um, but most of that journey, the, the rest of the iceberg was in therapy. I mean, I've, all, I've frequently joked that my virtual tour is becoming a PSA for therapy. And I guess this event <laughs> is no exception. Um, that's where healing happened, right? That's where those old painful narratives were excavated and rewritten. Here is where I'm writing the story of being someone who is alive, right? There's, they just, they feel very related to me, but but certainly not identical or equivalent at all. So did you want to add anything or? So I I didn't, I, I was answering someone's question in the chat. So I can't even phrase it, re repose the question. Oh, sure. Um, was writing a healing process and how does that healing change over time as you read your work? Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't echo what already been said, but also I would say like behind the scenes in, in, in the process of writing. Um, I got to a point where I was interviewing my family a lot, like on the phone for hours at night with my, mostly with my mother and father. So outside of the poem, there was a lot of conversations going on that may not have happened. Otherwise, it actually be important not for that, but. Okay. Um, 
I had another question, but I don't see it anymore. Maybe the person decided they didn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but uh, I was wondering, uh, um, as far as like, I know that Hyde and Sunita, you're teaching. Are you teaching as well, Joy? Uh, this semester? Well, you, you, you do teach. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, how do you see your um, artistic work intersecting with your work as a, as a professor and teacher? And how do you, I guess, you know, how do you, how do you mentor younger poets? What, 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 is, like, what, what kinds of things do you consciously do to mentor uh, new poets, newer poets? I'll just say so many things I can't. <laughs> I just love young poets, new poets, and I'll do what I can. I wish I could work with more native poets, indigenous poets, especially women. I think, um, I agree with the so many things comment, but one thing that's been especially on my mind lately is um, trying to help my students feel centered and connected to their work and their writing and their craft in a way that is kind of protected as much as possible from POBIS. I think that increasingly professionalization is starting to feel like something poets have to do sooner and sooner and more and more often. Um, so, the thing that's been most on my mind, to be honest, in the last few weeks is trying to stand like a like a barrier, like a physical barrier almost between my students and their work and those kinds of uh, nagging pressures of the capitalist grind. Um, yeah, so I, 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 uh, so I, I find myself between like two extremes. Uh, of attitude. Sometimes I feel like Robert Hayden who said, I just teach so I can get a paycheck that allows me a lifestyle <laughs> in the <right> right <laughs> uh, But But of course, like, being in the classroom, I mean, like, I'm like, to be like, I'm a teacher and I'm like the only 31 feels a little arrogant. But I like being in the classroom with people. I like being in a space of thinking. And uh, I'm mostly only taught in community spaces or undergrads at this point. So uh, everyone that I'm sort of encountering has not already been ruined by the ugly language of theory. And it's really, it, it usually is like, really just, just re, uh, just sort of like reintroducing ourselves to ourselves and our child selves and like, like when we used to art, like naturally be excited about art poems and reading like that. Just like thinking together. I think this is important to do that. Mm -hmm. We had a question in the question asked where Hyde taught, but I think I'll ask all of you that question. So Hyde, do you want to talk about where you teach? Yeah, um, I teach at the Augsburg University Low Residency MFA and do visiting gigs wherever. Um, lately, they've been longer visiting distinguished professor, which I love because then I can afford my poetry lifestyle. Okay. <laughs> How about you, Sunita? I'm at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Okay, great. And Joy? Um, I am teaching at some community things where I'm from in Louisville, and then which which I feel like is most important at the moment. Um, considering what's going on right now, I feel like a lot of the writers there like are feeling this like urgency, but um, uh, don't like you know don't exactly know what the role of a poet is quite. So I, I taught I've been teaching and I'm, have in the works some things with Sarah Band in the community with Sarah. They're um, headquartered in Louisville. And then um, I teach, I, this semester I'm teaching Intro to Women's Studies at Great, great. 
Um, I guess I, I had asked that question to summarize the person's question, and I think it's so well written that I'm going to read it as she wrote it. And, um, and then, because there's two questions kind of buried in there. She says, as a student, I'm curious how you approach teaching or sharing your poetry with your classes. Poetry is intensely personal and requires a lot of vulnerability and courage. So my question is, do you feel comfortable sharing your work with your classes? How does being a published poet affect your teaching? Oh, can I go first? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, well, for the second part, I never share my work in class. <laughs> like, I don't know, somebody might feel differently about that, but I feel like it's like a whole pile. Like I do it. But um, I think it's really like I always start out giving strategies of like how to read poetry. Because I feel like no one teaches you how to read poetry and everyone's trying to read it. Like we're so um, indoctrinated into like the narrative arc and that sort of thing. So like just beginning to talk about like, how do I read this? Or like, what is my, what should my experience or engagement with a poem be, look like? Mm -hmm. And then I also, of course, like emphasize truth over beauty, which you know, is controversial. But of course, <laughs> the point of it all. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to ask you to go. <laughs> go well, then that works out mind meld. Um, yeah, I would never assign my own work just because, um, no, I that would make me super uncomfortable. Um, I think that when I was still a grad student and I was teaching classes as a grad student and starting to publish, that was a little bit more awkward for me than I feel about it now. Um, first of all, I think that, you know, those were the first university classes I ever taught while I was still in my PhD program. And um, I was already really stressed about how to be remotely a figure of authority as a young woman of color teaching her first classes ever as a graduate student. Um, and then I had started to publish these intensely autobiographical poems. Um, and I certainly had students who, used that as an opportunity to express familiarity, whether good or bad, that I was not comfortable with extending. I think that was just something, um, it helped just to get older, I guess, um, and to get credentialed. I think that helps, uh, that helped me at least feel a little bit more solid and more grounded. Um, and then also it helped me as well to stop having quite, um, frankly, speaking frankly, um, quite a white sort of conception of what authority could look like. You know, I think at that time I was struggling with advice that I had been given, which was, you know, be um, depersonalize yourself in the classroom in order to have authority. And um, if someone oversteps a boundary, figure out a way to reassert it, you know, where where it pointy shoes, although I do wear pointy shoes. So that's a terrible example. I genuinely love pointy shoes. Um, and I think that as as I had, as I gained more experience teaching, the thing that I started to realize is that I am most comfortable in my authority when I am someone who is approachable based on the boundaries that I've set for just being an ethical human in the world. So I think that as I've kind of grown in, into feeling more and more comfortable with that, it has not really felt in the last few years, like a conflict at all to be both in the classroom and, and publishing work, even work that's very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a wonderful um, approach and way to look at it because, you know, I always feel like if one of my students showed up with one of my more, you know, sensitive poems, it would be weird. <laughs> so far, that hasn't happened. But, uh, but yeah, I, I love your approach and I'm probably gonna take a few pointers from you, thank you. Um, we are actually at the end of our time. I can't believe that it, it went so fast. Um, but I would like to encourage everyone to buy books, buy these wonderful poets. You can click on the button that says buy books um, or you can uh, go to Rain Taxi's uh, website and click there. Um, I'm so excited that I got to have this conversation with you and you had so many people here to enjoy your poetry and your wisdom. Um, I, I very much appreciate you coming and, and being a part of this year's festival. So can every, everybody 
can silently applaud you. I can audibly applaud you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so and much. thanks, Joy and Hyde. This was awesome. Yes, thanks. Bye.